Oh, hello, and welcome back to another edition of Autism A to Z. My name is Thomas Henley, and welcome to a bite-sized introduction to the many autism concepts that you may come across on your autism educational journey. There's a lot of worries that I have about eating a banana on here. I'm sure someone out there is going to superimpose something very inappropriate onto that banana picture. Don't do it. Let me just turn that light up a little wee bit. Today's video topic is Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, or more commonly known as ARFID. Children with ARFID tend to show either little or no interest in food, and are characterised as being extremely selective eaters. As per the article from Megan Neff at Neurodivergent Insights, she characterised three different forms or three different reasons to why someone might develop ARFID. The more common one that's talked about is the aversive form of ARFID, meaning that it's very fear-based, related to past experiences which may have been uncomfortable with a certain food or certain type of food group, and it's generally related to the thoughts of eating something and a general feeling of fear when confronted with a certain type of food or a certain selection of foods, like chicken and salmonella. There's a lot of things that are out there which warn us about who make sure that you cook your chicken right and you know it's important that they are out there but for some people that could instill a sense of fear in that person and make chicken perhaps a fear food of theirs. The second aspect which is a lot more related to the autistic experience is the avoidance ARFID characterization. And this is basically to do with someone's sensory differences. There are a lot of aspects to food, such as the texture, the smell, the sight, the colours, the taste, which can be quite overwhelming for autistic people, but also quite overwhelming when all of the foods are mixed together. So they may be able to tolerate one particular type of food, but when it's mixed together in a little dish, can be quite overwhelming for some people, including myself. I don't know about you, but I once tried a McDonald's burger, and for some reason, the first time that I had this burger, I got very, very sick after, and I had to go to hospital, so I think my brain sort of associated burgers or sesame seeds with feeling sick or getting ill, and it took me a long time to get used to burgers again and start to enjoy them. The third aspect, or form, or type of ARFID would be the restrictive aspect of it meaning that someone has little to no interest in actually eating food, meaning that they don't particularly feel that hungry and they don't want to eat. You can imagine that there's a lot of things related to autism, such as interoception, which I am going to go into, which can impact someone's desire to eat. I think whilst I give my own personal experiences with certain food groups, it's important to highlight that ARFID is only a thing that is diagnosed when it's an issue. So if someone has a severe sort of lack in nutrition, or they lose a lot of weight, or they maintain a very, very low body weight, it might be seen as more of a disorder because it's impacting their life, their functioning, and even their social relationships in certain ways. And outside of ARFID, around 70% of autistic people have what is described as atypical eating habits. Could be related to our particular liking for routine, having the same things over and over again, perhaps related to the texture and all sorts of sensory elements related to the food. And in terms of ARFID, although ARFID is quite rare, around about 44% of young people who are diagnosed with this condition are autistic. So there's a pretty large crossover there if you consider the fact that autistic people are a very small minority of the population. For myself, when it comes to food, the things that I enjoy, I used to have a few problem foods, particularly mushrooms, tomatoes, eggs at one point even, that I couldn't eat, but it never really got in the way of me achieving my proper nutrition. Basically, I forced myself to eat these, these fear foods, these things that I didn't particularly like due to the flavour or the taste, and over time I found that with certain things, particularly eggs and mushrooms, after I ate them and sort of didn't experience ill effects from them, I believe that my brain sort of got accustomed to it, sort of habituated to it to a certain degree, and eating those foods 
then on, actually became something that I enjoyed. There are, of course, some other factors which tie autism to AFID, particularly difficulties with interoception. Interoception, if you don't know what it is, it's basically a dulled sense of your bodily needs, so you're not as acute or perhaps the signals that your body sends you in terms of hunger, thirst, or anything related to that, are a little bit blunted, a little bit dulled when compared to the average person. You can imagine for somebody who struggles to feel the signals of hunger or, or indeed fullness, then it might be a little bit more susceptible to developing some type of ED. And in the case of ARFID, when you consider the restrictive element of it, definitely has a lot of interplay into someone's interest in eating. Before we get into the three most common ARFID misconceptions, I really want to point out a particular book called Rainbow Girl from Livia Sara. Livia was actually on a podcast of mine at one point to discuss autism and eating disorders, and it was a really informative episode. And of course, if you're enjoying this so far, this series, please be sure to like and subscribe and push your boy up in the algorithm. So let's get into the three top misconceptions about ARFID. Number one, ARFID only occurs during childhood. It can be something that might be a little bit more prevalent in childhood, but both youngsters, teens, and adults can have ARFID. This change may be as a result of more time to go through treatment or various sort of natural progressions in somebody's taste buds or smell or sensory experiences, perhaps even exposure to certain types of food throughout their life. But it's important to highlight that this is not something that just immediately stops during childhood or after childhood. It's something that can persist far on into someone's life. Number two, ARFID is an eating disorder, but it's not always a result or it's not always done in order to lose weight. An important stipulation of this particular ED is that it's not always related to someone's body shape or body weight and their particular perceptions of them. And ARFID can occur alongside another one of these eating disorders, alongside other different mental health related conditions. Number three, ARFID individuals are just extreme picky eaters and they're just trying to be annoying. They're doing it on purpose. It's just a conscious effort because they want to eat sweeties or have a particular food and they just don't want to really try anything else or eat healthily. You know, these might be the common misconceptions or judgments that people might make about people with ARFID. But from my own experiences with um, adults who have ARFID, Sometimes if they try to move outside of their particular restrictive eating style, it can actually cause them to have physical illness and sickness. It's very difficult for them to keep these trigger foods or what may be described as fear foods down without feeling sick. And of course, it's not just being a picky eater, it's a serious disorder which can have both health and social consequences. So we talked a lot about what ARFID is, what about the treatment options for ARFID? Psychotherapy such as CBT or DBT, which is often favoured a lot within the autistic community, and even exposure therapy has been used to treat ARFID. They usually use a mixture of mental visualisation, writing and verbal discussions of the different aspects of exposure. I think there's some important notes to be made here some stipulations may it be. In terms of autism and exposure therapy, there's been a lot of negative connotations around it, associations that people have made between exposure therapy and a lot of different things. And from what I see online, it tends to focus around fear, which is different to perhaps ARFID, which is caused by sensory differences. So personally, I'm not sure how applicable using this type of strategy in foods that you just generally can't tolerate sensory-wise would be. When thinking about supporting a loved one or an individual that you know who has ARFID or ED, I think it's important to highlight the aspects of trust and safety. I took a course back in the day at university on supporting people with mental health difficulties, how to call it out and how to signpost them for support. And there is a lot of nuances when it comes to eating disorders, usually requiring a bit more of a subtle approach as opposed to calling it out. But if you're in doubt of anything which we have discussed today, I highly recommend checking in with a registered GP, doctor, psychotherapist who will be able to clear up 
a lot of the aspects that we've talked about today. And if you've enjoyed this, I highly recommend checking out this video. It's a podcast that I did with Livia Sara, the person that I mentioned before who has the book about Rayma Girl. It was a very productive interview that we had together. And remember to like and subscribe as it helps me out a ton as a small creator. I do have membership options which do give you a pretty hefty amount of benefits and it's at the lowest price that I could put it as. Click that notification bell and you'll get updated on future videos, future editions of Autism A to Z. See you later.